Tell me about some of the challenges that came along the way, you know, were there any barriers? The reality is we live in a world where there's a lot of hate and the color of my skin played a big part of that. I look back on some of the things in, in Europe where you're in the echelon going 60 Ks an hour and a guy gives you an elbow and puts you into the dirt. It was situations like that, you know, being spat on and stuff like that I had to deal with. Thinking in the back of my head and my subconscious mind, what would Major Taylor do in this situation? It was way worse than what I'm dealing with. So what would he do? And that's what will bring me back, you know, and, and go about it a diplomatic way. Joining us in the studio today is an American cyclist who currently rides for his own cycling team, the Bahati Foundation Elite Team. He specializes in criterium racing and track cycling. He's a 10-time national champion, motivator, public speaker, father, and husband. Please welcome Rasan Bahati. Rasan, welcome to the studio. David, thanks for having me today. It's so great to see you. Uh, Rasan, where are you in the world right now? So I am in Los Angeles, California. Uh, pretty much been here my entire life. Is it raining out there right now? Um, yeah, so we actually got some real rain uh, over the last week. Uh, and last night into this morning was like, it wasn't like California. Um, I actually like it a lot. Uh, just having a change of pace, um, having some, you know, mother nature run through here, but uh, also like thinking about people that are in um, flood areas and uh, mudslide areas. So it's, uh, it's also caused some devastation. So uh, just thinking about those oh, people yeah. as well, but you know, it's mother nature. My son goes to college in San Luis Obispo and they were just ordered a shelter in place up there. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty crazy. We're not used to weather like this. Our infrastructure is not set up for weather like this. So, um, yeah, we're just, uh, we have to be uh, cautious how we move around for the next couple of days. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Rasan, welcome to the show again. Um, we usually start out the show with just a little bit of foundational work. So, um, or foundational questions. So let's just start with some of the basics. Where were you born? So I was born in Linwood, California, um, which is just a really small, small city uh, next door to Compton, California, which may ring a bell to some of the listeners. Uh, Compton doesn't have a hospital, uh, or at least didn't have a hospital when I was born in the early 80s. Um, so yeah, I was born in Linwood. And you live nearby there now today, right? Yeah, not too far. Uh, my family picked up and left Compton when I was around 13 years old. Um, and we've been in LA ever since, which is, it's not far, you know, we're talking 10 miles. Sure. Sure. When you were growing up, what did your parents do? So as far back as I remember, um, my dad toured around playing saxophone. Uh, he also dabbled in, uh, telecommunications, uh, specifically like, um, directing and producing of some sort of films and commercials. And my mom, I think to sum her up, uh, was just a caregiver. And I shouldn't say just. Um, and I say caregiver because not only did she raise uh, seven children, I have five sisters and a brother, uh, she also was very intricate within the Compton Unified School District. She was the parent that would show up unannounced and make sure her children were doing the right thing, uh, busting me plenty of times doing the wrong thing. And eventually, I think the the faculty and the staff noticed that, you know, people respected her and she uh, cared about children and eventually got a job in the company Unified School District, um, mentoring and teaching um, kids that were at risk. They were either coming out of like juvenile hall, which is jail for kids 18 and under, or also mentoring and teaching uh, young girls who were uh, pregnant and still in high school. Wow. What a cool thing. Um, small world, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley and I went to Reseda High and we would often play um, all the schools in the LA Unified School District, including yours. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great, great time. So probably um, Compton High School, Dominguez High School, Centennial. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I went to Crenshaw High School in LA, uh, which was yeah. a big, I think back then it was a big baseball school. Daryl Strawberry went to uh, Crenshaw High School. Did he? Yeah. 
That's cool. Hey, tell me about your, your sisters and your brother. So five sisters and a brother, where are they in the world and what do they do? Yeah, I got a pretty dynamic uh, family. Uh, my, my siblings are all into something. Uh, and I'll start from the bottom. I, my youngest sister is a professional dancer. She's uh, been dancing since, as far as I can remember, she went to the school uh, that Debbie Allen had here in LA and went to a performing arts high school and you know, ended up on Disney Channel. And the next thing you know, she's dancing at the Super Bowl with Beyonce. And it, and it just escalated no from way. there. Um, yeah, she's been at it for a long time. Um, so everyone's super proud of her and just kind of going through the list. I have a sister who's a professional makeup artist and she works for, in the industry doing a lot of cool things. My brother, um, uh, was a DJ in the rap industry for a very, very long time. Uh, he, I think the highlight of his career is that, uh, he got to DJ for one of his favorite artists, which was Nas. Um, it, it, that's so, that's so cool to look back on that. Um, and then uh, I have a sister who's a property manager. By the way, they're all in Los Angeles. Um, so no way. My, my immediate family, yeah, they're they're all here. Um, and uh, yeah, my youngest, or uh, my my second youngest sister, uh, who helps actually run my foundation, recently took another job out of state, and so super proud of her. She's a uh, She's uh, what I like to call the the level headed sister in, in the group, uh, and she's the one where I'm kind of struggling with things. I can lean on her uh, for for guidance uh, because she's uh, like I said, she's very level headed. Um, yeah, then it's me, the cyclist. <laughs> wow, wow. Well, with such a big fan, I, I would imagine that many of you are pretty close in age. Is that right? Yeah. So my oldest sister just turned forty seven. And then it kind of ticks all the way down to the youngest one, which is 33. Got it. Uh, growing up, were you guys into sports? You know, uh, my first organized sport was baseball and uh, played baseball for a long time. I don't really remember my sisters playing many sports. I know they ran track at their local school, but it wasn't like an after school thing. Um, you know, looking back, growing up in Compton and having my family of my own right now, you think, how in the hell did, you know, your parents feed seven kids and keep them clothed and, you know, roof over their head? You know, I have three and that's challenging. Um, so it's like, if you think back, I'm like, all right, so if we didn't play sports or if my sisters didn't play sports, there was probably a really good reason why, you know? Um, and <laughs> sure. I think for, for me, um, my dad would tell the story that uh, he wanted a boy so bad. I was the fourth child and I was the first boy. So it kind of makes sense that I was a little spoiled and got, got a chance to play pretty much any sport I wanted to play. I also played music and stuff like that. Um, but for the most part, I think my parents just had a challenging time and doing the best they can do raising seven kids. For sure. For sure. Well, tell me about that on ramp then to cycling. Did you discover the bike early on or when did you? Yeah, growing up in Compton, um, you got the background history of my parents being involved in a school district. Um, and it was just one of those things where I was in class sometimes and acting a fool and didn't really pay attention in class. And to be honest with you, I didn't like school. I, you know, I would rather be playing baseball or running track or doing something related to sports. And uh, I didn't know, but my sixth grade English teacher, Mr. Reggie Garman, who's now retired, uh, was a USA cycling official and his son actually raced on the velodrome as a track sprinter. And uh, I got it. I got in some trouble and long story short, I'll, I'll get to the meat of it. He introduced myself and my parents to the sport of bikes. And when he said bikes, I thought he was talking about motorcycles, not <laughs> bicycles because no one in the hood says, you know, bikes for bicycles. And right. uh, I was introduced to the Olympic velodrome where the 1984 Olympics were held. Um, the Amateur Athletic Foundation was funded through that Olympics in 84, uh, where Nelson Bills won his uh, silver medal, being the first African-American yeah. to do so in a velodrome. And, uh, yeah, I hated it. You know, I, I didn't see anything attractive about riding a bike, uh, wearing the required uniform, the, you know, <laughs> pointy shoes and funny looking helmet. Um but it, in, a, in a sense, it was a form of punishment. And uh, my parents noticed a difference in my behavior, you know, three, four, six months down the road. 
I actually started to enjoy it, enjoying the, the company, being around people who didn't look like me. Um, you know, this was the same time, uh, if you're familiar with the name Sarah Hammer, she was in that program and look where she ended up as, you know, four or five time world champ. Um, so yeah, I ended up falling in love with the sport of cycling. And uh, this was between 11 and 13 years old before I actually did my very first bike race in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Despite the funny clothes, right? Despite the funny clothes. And you know what? They haven't really changed much, have they? Not much. They just feel better. <laughs> yeah, the, mater- the material's changed a little bit, for sure. Yeah, they look the same. Rasan, so you discovered the bike uh, through through track cycling and the velodrome, and it was really just an outlet to keep you out of trouble, right? It wasn't. Absolutely. It wasn't anything more than that. What what in school? What track were you on for? you know, education, did you have interests like, you know, history or geography or did you, you know, what were your career aspirations then, or did you not have any at that time? Yeah. Sixth, seventh grade. I didn't have any, man. I was, um, you know, they say you're a product of your environment and there's a lot of truth to that. But the flip side is like, how could you be such an idiot? You have mom and dad at home who cares about you. You know, I was running around with kids who didn't have mom at home or who didn't have dad at home. One is deceased, maybe one is incarcerated. They've been raised by their grandparents. And so, you know, you look back and it's like, I had everything that I needed to have to be successful, yet I was running with the wrong people. Um, So, you know, in a sense, cycling did save my life. Uh, It put me on a trajectory to do something so positive and to look at the world as not this concrete jungle that I know of Compton, but how big the world is that no one will ever see the entire world. Um, and it wasn't until high school, I think I got serious about education um, and what, how important it is, not only you know for something to fall back on in cycling, but just in general, how, how to navigate life. You need to be educated. You know? Take me then from Crenshaw. You went to Crenshaw High, right? Mm-hmm. Take me from Crenshaw to Indiana University and how did that come about? How did you, you know, Indiana's halfway across the country practically. How did you get exposed to Indiana? Why Indiana? And then what did you do there? Yeah, so Crenshaw High School was uh, bend in the corner, I would say, becoming like one of the top high schools, public high schools in the area. Um, The class of 99 is when I graduated. I thought was one of the best classes um, being seeing the classes before and seeing the classes after. Uh, we had teachers who cared, you know, we had counselors who cared. We had um, a principal who cared, who who wanted to see the, the students succeed. And I think that had a lot to do with um, where some of my peers are now, you know, very successful, went on to college. And so I started off to say Sony actually, through Whoopi Goldberg, donated money to Crenshaw High School to start this TV production program. And you had to uh, it was a two-year program, so you had to join in as a junior, which I did. And it was easy for me because my dad was already in that. And I used to run around with my dad all the time. I, I learned how to edit before I was even in high school using an Avid, you know, um, which is way outdated. Um, yeah, so a friend of mine, Kenny Burgess, who now lives in Georgia, um, who, by the way, got me kicked out of class after he saw that I was in the <laughs> LA Times newspaper from traveling to uh, Argentina representing the United States at the Pan Am Games. He didn't know me by then, but he's like, is this you? And he came in talking and the teacher's like, you need to pipe down, you know? And uh, he kept talking like, I want to do this. I want to be a cyclist like you. We got kicked out of class. Long story short, we become friends. He became a cyclist, but we were also in the TV production class together. We graduate high school. I go to Loyola Marymount for a semester, don't want to go to college. All I want to do is race bikes because I'm looking at what the Michael Creed's of the world and Danny Pates of the world were doing. And they were in Europe racing bikes. And I thought I had the goods to go over there. So um, I did. And I talked to my dad about it. And it was like, all right, let's set some goals for yourself. What are those goals? And my goals were to win junior nationals, road, crit, win some titles on the track and go to world's track and road. So I had five tangible goals as my last year as a junior in 18. And I, I accomplished all of those things. I won nationals on every category that I entered that year, uh, made it to track worlds, made it to road worlds. I didn't win, um, but it was such a great experience. 
And then I was just in Europe racing bikes. And um, Noel, who recently passed away, the USA Cycling Team coach, um, was uh, was the coach. And, and uh, I got an offer to go to IU. It was kind of twofold. There was a guy named Courtney Bishop who was putting together a team because he wanted to put together an all-black team for the Little 500. It had never been done before. Courtney's a black guy. And um, he reached out to a guy named Josh Weir, who's a native of Indianapolis, who I knew through track racing. Josh connected all the dots with all the other cyclists. Um, But then they also had this initiative to get more African-Americans on campus through a TV production program. So it was like the timing was just perfect. Um, I was still in Belgium at the time. Uh, Kenny lived in L.A. He uh, got a U-Haul with my dad. They packed all my stuff up, and Kenny drove the U-Haul with his buddy to Indiana, and I met him there, and the rest is history. That's the coolest thing. And you studied computer animation and telecommunications, right? Yeah, uh, it was actually uh, African-American literature. So computer animation was my focus. Uh, I love video games, and I thought that, man, how cool would would it be to – kind of marry the two things that I love, gaming and and cycling. And I wanted to make like a robust, immersive video game. Um, (laughs) Never did because, of course, cycling took over again. But um, that was my goal. What a fun time, right? Rasan, we're going to switch now to this sort of speed round we call the sprint round where I throw a bunch of things at you and you tell us what your personal preference is, all right? Uh It's our way of sort of analyzing your your likes and dislikes in the world. (laughs) All right. Pancakes or waffles? Pancakes. Beer or wine? Beer. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Tacos or burritos? Tacos. Spicy or mild? Extra spicy. Cold weather or hot weather? Hot weather. Rain or snow? Rain. The mountains or the beach? Definitely the beach. Big cities or quiet suburbs? Quiet suburbs. Cars or trucks? Oof. That's a tough one. I love both. I drive both. Uh, I'm going to go with car. Hey, on that note, that that silver speedster in your Instagram feed, is that yours? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is a sweet ride. Pavement or dirt? If you ask me today which you are, it's going to be dirt. <laughs> really? Dirt? Man. Yeah, man. I'm really enjoying it. Gloves or gloveless? Gloveless. Even in the dirt? Um, it depends. If it's something new that I'm not aware of and I don't know the trails, I may throw some gloves on. Oftentimes, I start my trail riding with my gloves in my pocket. And if I feel like it's getting dicey, I'll put them on. But most of the time... I just, yeah, I'll let the hands take the beating. If, what about if you're in a crit race? Are you riding gloves or gloveless? Uh, 90% of the time it was gloveless. The only time I put gloves on is when I knew like this race had a a knack for big crashes. For instance, a perfect example is the Athens Twilight. I'm going gloves on for Athens. (laughs) All right. Clipped in or flat pedals? Clipped in. Low pressure in your tires or high pressure in your tires? <laughs> Definitely high. I went riding the other day and people were like, why do you have 40 PSI on your mountain bike? They were running like 20. I was trying to go faster. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fix it yourself or take it to a mechanic? Definitely a mechanic. And last question, dogs or cats? Dogs. All right. So the next next part of the show is let's talk about your career. So. You leave Indiana. How did you transition into a quote unquote professional bike racer or were you already a professional bike racer at the time? Yeah. So I was fortunate enough to be hired by Saturn cycling team, which is one of the longest running American teams, uh, you know, that ended in 2005, I believe 2004, they ran for close to two decades. Um, alongside with like the navigators team. Um, and so my first two years in Indiana, I was still fully sponsored, but not really racing. Um, they 
did a tremendous job, in my opinion, really hanging their hat on me being the only black professional um, at that time. Uh, and I think it was specifically in the United States. And so I was kind of like the show pony, which was OK for me because I'm a college kid with no money. So Saturn wasn't footing the bill. It was GM that was footing the bill and like right. put me on airplanes and I was going to these car shows. I was getting 500 a buck, $500 a day per DM. So it was great. It was wow. like, oh, yeah, send me. Um, and so that's how I kind of stayed afloat the first two years. The team went away and I was on my own. I just kind of did my own thing. I had some local sponsors around the California, LA area and uh, continued to kind of just race locally when I got home through the summer. And when I left IU, I thought it was over. You know, I had a job offer to work for EA Sports, you know, and at that time, 22 years old, 65 grand offer. I was like, Oof. all right, take yeah. it, right? Sign me up. But then, yeah, but then this small team out of Northern California, McGuire and Langdale came knocking. I said, uh, I think the guy name was Terry, Terry Curley. Hey, I'm putting together this team with Eric Saunders and some other guys. Um we would uh, love to have you on a team. And I said, well, all right, cool. Can you pay me at least 40 grand? He's like, I can't pay you anything. I was like, oh, <laughs> all right. Uh, I'll take it. And I ended up taking the gig. <laughs> yeah. I, I took the gig with the team. And, uh, you know, it was amazing. Um, I had the leadership of Eric Saunders. Uh, we spent a lot of time in, in France racing bikes. Uh, he's a Santa Barbara guy. And uh, we went around in a van. We couldn't fly anywhere. And we just kicked butt all across the country. And uh, I got a couple big podiums um, during Philly week. Uh, and the next thing you know, Jonathan Bodders come knocking. And I signed with TIAA Cref uh, in 2006. And that's kind of how I got my foot back in the door. Wow. Tell me about some of the challenges that came along the way. You know, were there any, you know, any barriers that, you know, it sounds like doors kind of opened for you, but there must have been some barriers along the way. I mean, tons. This, I think, uh, with with this episode, it could be like a three-part. I mean, I, there's a whole episode just about my time at IU, you know, and right. uh, all the all the marginalization that I faced to not only myself, but my teammates uh, and my friends that I lived with, uh, we were on, on, we were in, on campus for one semester and had to move off campus and had to get written. Um, we had to get someone to write an authority letter, basically from a, a authority point of view to let us off campus. Cause of course, as a freshman, you're supposed to stay on campus just because we were dealing with so much racism mm. because we had an all black cycling team. That was really good that was going to compete in a little 500. Um, at the time, like I said, I was racing for Saturn and as an athlete on Saturn, you got a free car every year. And here I am in a Saturn car and windows are busted one morning, tires are slashed one morning, you know, and it was all over basically a weekend softball game. There's no money involved in a little 500, you know, there's yeah. bragging rights and that's it. And Rasan, what year is this? This is 2001 to 2003. Right. Yeah. So not, not that far removed. It's incredible. Yeah. So, I mean, like I said, I can go really deep on that, but uh, in cycling in general, um, you know, is the reality is we live in a world where there's a lot of hate and the color of my skin played a big part of that. Uh, just with people being ignorant. I, I'm going on a record to say, I don't think everyone's racist. That's not black. You know, I think a lot of it is pure ignorance and, Part of it, part of it is our society not educating people, you know. Um, right. and, and now I feel like it's even worse because you have in your hand, you know, this device where people can just say whatever they want and it triggers certain things. So, yeah, in cycling, it was definitely uh, windows and doors that closed and obstacles and being at French Cup races where you're the only. I used to say I, I was the raisin in milk, you know, and having some people who adored me and and was uh kind of like if you know any history of major taylor you know major taylor had a lot of racism towards him but he also had white people who was just like they they loved him they couldn't believe that it was a guy who you know someone said was you know one fifth of a human but he's out there kicking mm -hmm. their butt so they just like embraced that and i think i had a little bit of that as well rasan well, tell me about some of the differences that you experienced in the similar sort of similar social challenges 
with race in the United States versus when you were racing in Europe? Did you face the same type of either discrimination or racism? I did. Um, and as I got older, I quantified a way to look at it because at times I was like, why are they like this? And they are like this, meaning European to, um, to the United States. And what I would say here in the U.S., when I was racing and I had incidents, they were more overt. Like, I don't like you. You're black. Get that out of here. Where right. I look back on some of the things in, in Europe, um, they were more um, covert where you're in the echelon going 60 Ks an hour and a guy gives you an elbow and puts you into the dirt. Hmm. You know, um, some people may say that's racing, which is not. Um, some I, I looked at it as, you know, it was a move like, you can't be in front of me. You can't be here. You don't even belong up here. Um, so it was situations like that, you know, being spat on and stuff like that I had to deal with. And I just did a, a interview not too long ago about Major Taylor. And there was a question that was asked, how did you deal with that? sort of stuff yeah. and you know some people say hey, no I'm, i'll lose it all i'll risk it all i'll throw away the career whatever it is i'll risk it all and for me it wasn't even about risking at all it was about thinking in the back of my head and my subconscious mind what would major taylor do in this situation and that's what i would often think about what would he do it was way worse than what i'm dealing with so right. what would he do and that's what will bring me back you know and, and go about it a diplomatic way that's incredible because, yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine, right? But you, you're you so positive and you're so strong and I couldn't – personally, it's difficult for me to relate to um, because I haven't lived your life and I haven't been in those situations. I feel like if I was in that situation, I might quit. Um, but you had that – that either that foresight or that vision to say to yourself, what would Major Taylor do? But there must have been something else inside you, right? Your your values uh, that you were taught by your parents, right? The people around you, you must have been able to lean on something else internally, right? Major Taylor is an amazing role model, but I'm just probing for something a little bit more about you. What is it about you that kept you strong? Yeah, I think you touched on it. Definitely upbringing. Uh, definitely seeing uh, the struggles that your your parents went through. You know, um, I think my my parents did a great job disguising that we were poor. I never knew we were poor until I got older. You know, hmm. um, and so I think that's important. And I try to use those same principles today. Uh, and, and and my household, it's like you don't need to talk to your kids about money. They got a roof over their head. The heater's on right now. You know, there's food in the fridge. That's all I need to worry about, you know. Um, and so I think definitely uh, my upbringing. And it's funny, too. You know, you, you become a cyclist at a, such a young age. And at 15, 16 years old now, I'm already doing pro races. So my immediate circle are now in their 30s and 40s. You know, I'm not hanging out with kids my age. Yeah. And I think that yeah. helped you see things a little differently because now the people you're hanging out with have that wisdom. You know, they've, they've more than likely been through the things that I'm going to go through. And so I think that helped me overcome a lot of those things. And, and honestly, I didn't want to give up. You know, I don't I don't quit easily. And uh, uh, there's a sense of pride, pride there. And I think uh, we, we often joke about, you know, celebrities and people that come from the inner city. They have a lot of pride, you know, and um, yeah. and I think that that's just a product of my environment. Yeah. Now you have kids of your own now, three kids, right? What, what are their ages? So I have a 14 year old, a 16 year old and a 19 year old, three daughters. And would you say that you are doing your best to pass on those values to them? It is a struggle, my brother. You know, <laughs> uh, I feel like I'm doing my best and oftentimes feeling like you're doing your best doesn't really appear like you're doing your best. Um, yeah. but sometimes I just sit back and say, I know they're listening, you know, cause I did the same thing to my parents. I try to act like it was going in one ear and out the other. And then one day in your life, you can be like, yep, they were right. And then you start implementing those things that, that they taught you. Um, so yeah, you just never give up. You, you continue to, um, 
uh, do it inch by inch, you know, and not trying to just kill the whole mile. You just continue to talk to them and educate them. Are any of your girls into cycling? No, such a sad moment when they were born, <laughs> uh, specifically my oldest one. I mean, I went out and bought the little 26 inch Pinarello and, you know, all the gear. And I was like, she's definitely going to be a cyclist. And uh, I took a chapter out of my parents' book. My parents never pressured me to ride bikes. And yeah. when I noticed that she wasn't into it or any of them wasn't into it, that was it. I just stepped back and I allowed them to find the things that they were passionate about. So um, my oldest daughter is in college in Oregon. She's a 100 meter hurdler and uh, she is really good in track and field. And then my middle daughter is a middle distance runner. Um, still in high school. And then my youngest is trying to figure out what she's going to do. Um, but yeah, three, uh, three amazing kids and, uh, you know, at least in public, they act right, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah. Ain't that the case? I mean, my kids, uh, at home definitely act different than they, they do with, you know, other adults. Exactly. <laughs> so changing gears a little bit, have you ever been in any really bad bike crashes? Oh yeah. Um, I've broken what, 12 bones. Um, one of the worst crashes, uh, happened in a charity ride hotter than hell. I was doing a charity ride in Wichita Falls, Texas, and was behind a car helping a guy motor pace back to the group. The driver drove us over a two by four going like 50 miles an hour. Yeah. I hit it. And, uh, next thing you know, I woke up in someone's yard busted up patella. I mean, my knee was just like out of this world. And uh, it was one of those crashes that you, you may have had something like this or some of the listeners who are in the crazy sports um, where you're like, I'm never touching a bike again. You know, I'm in the hospital. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, hey, where's your bike? And I'm like, I don't care. Whoever have, have it, they can have it. Tell them they can have it. I don't want to see it again. Yeah, I'm done. And, uh, yeah, I'm done. And of course, you know, times hills and i i got better and of course i started riding again but that was a really really bad crash Ooh. you didn't quit you kept going you didn't give that bike away or actually you probably did because the bike was probably trashed right i took all the hit the bike was totally fine oh wow yeah i did end up giving the bike away i uh i i gave it to a junior out somewhere on the east coast so yeah it went to good hands but you kept, so, you know, you recovered, probably recovery was probably six, eight, nine months, right? That took a while if your patella was all smashed up, right? Yeah, it was uh, at least three months. And at the time, right before the trip, literally the day before I left to go to Wichita Falls, Texas, I bought a, a GTI, um, TDI, a little golf, and it was a stick. Yeah. I was so excited to have a stick because I was commuting <laughs> back and forth from LA to Orange County. And yeah, so I get home and couldn't even drive my new car. It, you know, cause it was it was left, I needed left my leg. leg. It was my, yeah, yeah, exactly for the clutch. <laughs> <laughs> so it took me a while yeah. to heal. I got you on that one. I broke my left leg biking and yeah. Fortunately I had an automatic <laughs> car though. Um, well you kept going though, right? You kept racing, you recovered, you kept racing. And then, um, tell me about the transition then from racing to the foundation i'm a little cloudy and the research doesn't really show how the the genesis of that transition mm -hmm. happened so tell tell us about that yeah so you know my career kind of uh, second career started in 2006 and then um i ended up meeting a guy named michael ball who was the owner of a clothing company called rocket republic he saw me at the track nationals my hair was just my hair was so big. I had an Afro and with the helmet on, it was like, you know, hair poking out all the vents. And he just came over. It was like, man, I love your style. You know, um, I want to sponsor you. And I was like, oh yeah, I hear that all the time. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I took him up on it. I went to this office in Culver city where, you know, it was nothing but like supercars in the driveway and the parking lot. And, women that were dressed very provocative when I walked in, I'm just like, what is going on? I never heard of rock and Republic. I, you know, I don't buy $300 sure. pair of jeans. And, uh, yeah, we ended up talking about him sponsoring me and I explained to him, that's not really how it works. You know, uh, it's not like I'm a single individual who can have a team. 
our, you know, race for himself. So we ended up starting a team. He's like, how much does it cost? And I gave him three scenarios, like 250, 500 and a million. And of course he chose the million. <laughs> and the first person I hired was Justin Williams. And uh, I was just like, dude, you're turning pro. I have to pay you 25 grand. And I was like, you have nothing to say. Just say yes. And uh, <laughs> Rock Racing started. And so Rock Racing allowed me to do some bigger races. And eventually um, we went to Europe and was doing some racing over there. Um, and uh, doing a race in Switzerland and actually getting my head kicked in. Like, worst time of my life. I'm holding on to the car just to make the time cut. And I'm back there yeah. with a, a Swiss guy. And he's like, cycling is not for us. We should pick something else. I'm like, man, I've come too far to quit now. And we ended up hooking up in the hotel, the team hotel. And he, he asked me, like, what would you do after cycling? And without hesitation, I said, man, I would love to get more people into the sport where I came from. And that was the seed that was planted right there. That was 2009. And uh, got home, started kind of digging around. Um was introduced to a guy named Jeff Carcitti, who was an attorney out of Orange County, who stepped up to the plate and said, hey, man, I'll do this for free, pro bono. I'll, I'll, I'll get mm. your status. He did all the paperwork for us, and we launched the foundation March 2010. And what's the, the, the mission, the core mission of the Bahati Foundation? The core yeah. mission is to inspire inner city youth. And um, – uh, we talk about helping them rise above their circumstances. And you look at, if you listen to the first part of this interview, it's about rising above my circumstances. You know, my circumstances sure. said that I was going to be a class clown uh, in the penitentiary or in the dirt, you know. Um, and here I am, a black guy out of Compton who didn't have to wrap his way out or dribble his way out, throw his way out or swing his way out. You know, I rode a bike. And that's rising above your circumstances. Uh, I'll tell you a quick story. Crenshaw High School, Justin Williams went there. Corey Williams went there. Yeah. His brother, CJ, another guy named Ali Kamara, Kenny Burgess, myself. So I just named six people. Five of those are all national champions in road or track cycling out of Crenshaw yeah. High School. And these stories are never told. Do you have any like handshake deal with Crenshaw High to have some permanent programming or development with them? Unfortunately, I don't. When I first launched the foundation, one of the first things I wanted to do was help the music department. Um, so if our three pillars are education, music, and sports. And music is the first thing I actually learned to do. Five, six years old, my dad taught me how to play saxophone. So here I am, you know, playing scales up and down, chromatic scales before I was even you know, on a bike. And so music has been in my life forever. Um, so when I got out of high school, the music department was kind of going downhill and we raised funds through a partnership through Guitar Center and got brand new instruments for the entire program, helped them get new uniforms. Believe it or not, David, it's really tough to talk to these school districts. You know, they're very yeah. defensive. Um, they think you want something from them. Um, and unless you're walking in with this huge check, it's kind of like you're pushing water uphill. Um, so it took a long, long time for us to establish this relationship that we currently have now with LAUSD. But back then, in you know, 2011, 12, 13, it was so hard to do. Um, what we did with the band was straight through the band and the teacher. Didn't even go through the school district. Wow. I want to keep talking about the Bahati Foundation, but I just want to circle back just momentarily to, to rock racing. <laughs> oh my, what an incredible ride that was. I remember yeah. you guys were the bad boys of the sport, you know, the little bit of a revolving door. You guys had an edge, you had an attitude, you had the best style, the coolest kits, the loudest, the most flamboyant. Um, it didn't last very long though, did it? No, it did came crashing down, which was unfortunate. Um, some of it was self-inflicted, you know, to be honest. Um, but being that I was one of the guys closest to Michael, he really liked me. Uh, he respected me. I respected him. Um, he, you know, he had a lot of things against them as well, you know, um, not only from the hires, but also just cycling in general was like, no, you can't do that. You can't show up with eight Escalades. What are you doing? You can't show up to a bike race like that. Why is your team flying on a private jet? Like, 
And so, it, you know, uh, it wasn't really accepted, you know, uh, even though opening day when they launched the first kit for sale, you know, they did over a million dollars. But those were fans. But cycling itself, I think, in my opinion, didn't really accept how he um, was moving about in the sport. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was an interesting time. It just I think we as an industry definitely rejected the flamboyant, extravagant spend that was happening, right? It wasn't mm -hmm. truly mission driven or values or purpose driven. Um that probably could have gone a long way to making it sustainable had there been an element of that. Yeah, I mean, you look at what I'm doing, you look at uh, I mentioned Justin was one of the first hires. You look at what he's doing. Not that there's a, they're exactly the same, but there are definitely some parallels, you know, and yeah. that's a chapter out of that book of rock racing. Then a little edgy. Um, but like you said, having a focus, having a mission, I think is very important. Um, but also not really caring what people think and uh, just believing in, in self. And I think, Michael and, and and his team really believed that they were doing the right thing for the sport, which, you know, for three years, it was, um, it was great. It was the, the tour of California is the tour of Georgia is all benefiting from having uh, those teams, uh, you know, in, in their events. And I just remember our very first race was the uh, uh, Valley of the sun in Tucson, Arizona. And, you know, mm, we had yeah. blank kits that were um, screen printed, and we went out there and swept the podium and, you know, we still didn't get respect. It wasn't until uh, I won later that year at the CSC Invitational in Alexandria, Virginia, that we got respect. You know, it was like not only did we beat the U.S. teams, we beat the European teams as well. And uh, so it was like the bad boys turned kind of like a Cinderella team. Um, and I remember that day like it was yesterday. Yeah. Interesting. You know, you know, what you're doing with the Bahati Foundation, what Justin is doing with, you know, developing a, a league of, of crit teams is pretty cool and pretty special. And it seems like it seems like we're just coming into this new era of either road cycling or education development related to cycling. Would do you do you think what what um, what's behind that? Is it you guys, or is there more to it? Is there a bigger appetite for it? Where's it coming from? I mean, I think it will be foolish not to look at the pioneers and say that they have something to do with it. Um, but I also think through our society, um, the civil unrest that we had a couple years ago, and all the things that have morphed into where we are today, even the pandemic has a lot to do with it. Um, I think people are more. I would say people are more open. I will go on the on the on the edge and say that that people are more receptive to change. People are more, um, you know, they're they're allowing people to express themselves in ways that ten years ago you couldn't express yourself that way, you know. Um, and so I think that has a lot to do with it. And the industry still has a long way to go, in my opinion. There are still companies out there that don't look at people of my skin tone and skin color and use them in in advertisement. Um, for fear of they think they're doing a check check box thing, a fear of well that's not us. Okay, if it's not you, that's not you. You show, you show your colors, but the reality is we're the biggest demographic that's growing the sport. So why wouldn't you cater to this demographic? You know, why wouldn't you talk to yeah. us? Why wouldn't you bring us in and help you? You know, figure out how to crack the nut to make sure those pandemic riders stay on board. Um, so yeah, I think we still have a long way to go. Um, I think there has been a lot of positive change. Um, and now for me, it's about amplifying other groups like the Bahati Foundation, like the Legions, like whoever else is out there that's doing the work that's not really getting the spotlight right now. It's our duty to help them get that spotlight to spread their wings more because the more groups we have like us, the better, you know? Yeah, yeah. Rasan, tell me in your bio, we talk about you being a, a motivator and a public speaker. Um, I, of course, have seen you as a speaker before. I'm listening to you now. Um, but how do you show up as a, a motivator and a public speaker? Where do you do that? Do people hire you? Where do you speak? And what's your message? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I didn't uh, plan to be a speaker. I didn't plan to have people hire me to come speak to their corporations. And it just kind of happened. Um, 
I, uh, of course, have done some Zoom stuff where I'm speaking to small cycling clubs. And, you know, he's just turning over rocks. You know, there is one person on a Zoom call that's like, man, I loved his story. And he works for a, a huge company. And next thing you know, you're speaking to that company. And then it just snowballs. Um, I would say my first really big one uh, was with People for Bikes. It was a sort of a TED Talk setting. Um, and I think what people, what resonates with people is that it's not scripted. Um, you know, I'm lucky enough to not have to have a notepad or anything up there. I'm just talking from the heart and I may skip over some words and, uh, miss, uh, pronounce some things, but it's just coming from the heart. And uh, I think people uh, appreciate that. So yeah, it's been, uh, it's been pretty interesting that I've actually been able to talk and have people to pay me to talk and which has been great. Um, in May, of last year, I was laid off from Zwift. That was my full-time job. And so that's really when the public speaking kind of thing picked up. And it was just, it was perfect timing. And I'm um, super, super appreciative of it. And I still have a lot on the docket coming up for this year. So excited about that. That's cool. That's cool. And of course, the Bahati Foundation, which you're an active uh, driver of, um, let's get back to that for a moment. So what are what are some of the things that the Bahati Foundation is focused on? You mentioned education, music, and sport. Those are the three pillars, right? Um, what types of programming exist in those pillars? Yeah, so we'll start at the bottom. Well, I shouldn't even say the bottom. I'll start with sports. Um, the executive director, which is my father, um, created this program that we've been kind of working on for a while called Be Smart Cycle. And basically we're putting this uh, academic program into the schools, the elementary schools that we work with. These are how we, this is how we identify the students that we give a bike to. So every December we have a select group of students. This year was 200. Uh, Giant and Live donates 200 bikes and we give these really nice bikes to these kids that are academically sound, respectful, on time, attendance well, you know, they check all the boxes. And of course, they pass the Be Smart Cycle um, curriculum. Um, and then we also work with two organizations outside of the school district, which is uh, Los Angeles Unified, sorry, Los Angeles Police Department, and uh, one organization out of Long Beach. Um, and so those kids also get bikes through our program. And then um, we have the music part where we're doing um, donating instruments. And then we also have with the education. I mean, it's so many parts of the education. Yeah. Uh, we have summer programs where we're taking kids to UCLA to learn about STEM and STEAM. Um so that's a program uh, we recently partnered with Upward Bound, which is another summer program, which gets high schoolers on college campuses during the summer so they can get acclimated to what it's like to be on a college campus. One of the classes is cycling, and that's the program rerun. Um, and um, uh, it's, I mean, it's a lot of different things Yeah, we do through the year. We, we, we stay pretty busy. And uh, to be honest with you, David, it was maybe over the last six years that we really honed in and found our groove, um, you know, because everything else was kind of like these small little tests to try to figure out how we can really have a positive impact. And it took it took about five years to make that happen. And, you know, t- a good two and a half or three of those in a pandemic. Right. How how did the pandemic either challenge or shape or amplify the foundation work yeah that was interesting time um so our very first bike giveaway i was gun ho on not only giving bikes but also giving gifts having health screenings for parents and and the kids that are there so we had it in person um and the last thing which came out of nowhere people were like huh was a christmas tree you know i wanted a Christmas tree could be expensive. It's an expense for a lot of families. And so you think if you can save them 150 bucks, 250 bucks, whatever they cost, that's a big deal. So the, the first two years of our bike giveaway, not only did the kids get bikes, the parents went home with a tree. And if they didn't have a car and they caught the bus there, I put the trees in a truck and I drove them to every single parent. And that meant a lot to me. Yeah. I mean, when I was, when I started my family and we first were going to go buy a Christmas tree, I thought a tree was like 20 bucks. 
you know, and you get to the lot <laughs> and they're like, oh yeah, for this one, it's 350 for that one. is I was like, what? Um, so that was dear to my heart. It's like, let's eliminate that barrier. Um, so during the pandemic, I thought it was such an amazing time for us to continue to do our bike giveaway, but how do we pivot? So we partner with Amazon. Um, and luckily there was someone within our cycling network, our community, uh, Taisha Walker, who's, who has her fleet of Amazon trucks because they're all independent. Mm. And she stepped up to the plate and she said, I'll deliver the bikes for you. I'll get my crew to deliver the bikes. You just give me the, the addresses. They came to my house, they picked up, I think 80 bikes and they delivered every single bike, helmet, lock and bike. Um, through, through Giant and Live, which was pretty amazing. And so, you know, the reason I say it was interesting times because remember there was a lot of guilt within the community, within the cycling industry. A lot of people was like, oh shit, we better, all right, we haven't did anything for our counterparts. Here, let's write a check to the Bahati Foundation for 50,000. And I would look at my dad and be like, no, we're not taking that. They didn't help yeah, us when I was we're... knocking, yeah, you know, two, yeah, three years you, ago. 10 years ago. Thank you. And I mean, it was some big zeros, you know, a couple commas, a couple commas here and there. And so we just, you have to stand on two feet and you have to believe in what you're doing. And yes, we did benefit from the pandemic and the civil unrest. Um, and it was a chance for us to kind of stand now solid on two feet, you know, and it helped us kind of get ahead a little bit. Um, but I was proud that we were able to say, no, not right now. Come back to me in a couple of years. Let me see what you've been doing over those last couple of years. And I can look right now and I won't name companies, but they're not doing anything. They did it for six months, but now they're back to the same old job. So um, it's their company. They can do whatever they want, but I'm just telling you how I feel and how I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Rasan, uh, kudos to you and your family and everyone around you that supported you along the way. And uh, I'm super excited that we got a chance to connect and and hear your story and share it with the world. Uh, we are just about out of time, unless there's something else you wanted to share. Anything else? No, we'll be here another hour. Maybe we can do a follow up <laughs> in the summer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's do let's do that. Let's do a part two next year. Yeah, we can focus on some other things. You told me this this might be a three parter anyway, right? Very easily, seriously, very easily. Yeah. All right, man. Well, hey, thank you so much for uh, for hanging out with us and sharing your message. We'll put some of the links to to your organizations in the notes below, so people can find you, uh, and you'll be able to see this on YouTube and and all the various podcast platforms wherever people consume content these days. David, I appreciate you. Thanks so much, man. Have a fantastic day. You do the same. Take care. All right. Cheers.